Well, joining me to discuss all of this right now is Bob Seeley, Conservative MP and member of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Good morning to you, Bob. Good morning, Julie. Good morning, Thanks to very much, Steve, for joining us. Uh, Claire Piss is also here, formerly an advisor at the uh, Home Office as well. I'll get her thoughts at the end of this. But, um, just, I mean, just first of all, what Jeremy Hunt had to say, he's quite right. Look, he's the Chancellor. The Defence Secretaries don't decide their budgets. Chancellors and Prime Ministers do. How much more should we be spending on defence, particularly in such uncertain times? There's absolutely no point me or any other backbench politician coming out with a figure saying 2.4, 3.2, 2.7, OK? Um, it's what you buy for that and what you what deterrence affect. If you spend 20% and you don't deter... Of GD, failed. this is of GDP, spend... the percentage. Well, it, we probably need to increase our defence expenditure. But more than that, we need to work out how we can deter our adversaries and what is the best use of that expenditure. Do we need to focus more on our defence? Yes. We are living in a really dangerous dangerous world um, and that world became more dangerous since 2007 when Putin declared the new Cold War and yeah. we looked the other way for as long as we conceivably could. Yeah. So we need to presume that we're either in an era of pre-global war, a pre a third world war, or we are in an era of massively heightened tension and instability as the world goes through one of these profound shakeups that's happening 70, 80 years after the previous reset, which is in World War II. So we need to think and contextualize what we're doing. And yes, we need to spend more money, but it's not just a question of spending more if it yeah. goes on stuff that doesn't have And, an and we, we know the MOD has a shocking, shocking uh, 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 history of in terms of badly spending uh, huge sums of money uh, from the British it, taxpayer. So we do need to make yeah, sure you, procurement is improved. A procurement, OK, to give this government credit, the procurement, whilst still imperfect, is massively better than it was. And one of the great pushes in the last few years within the MOD has been to improve the procurement system. The problem with that, Julia, is that one minute we say procurement is absolute disaster, the next minute we say, well, of course, everything should be made in the UK. Yeah. And making stuff in the UK when we can find cheaper abroad will Cost sometimes more. affect the price. Yeah. So there is a balance to be struck by making sure that we're buying stuff. What we need to do above all is to stop buying some basic off-the-shelf kit and then letting every general, and there are probably still too many in the British Army, tinker with the spec so that we are ending up endlessly with some Heath Robinson contraption, which then always breaks down. We need to get more off and, the And shelf costs kit. an absolute but fortune, people, yeah. Um, but there's no doubt people, at all. We have an awful lot. I, mean, I think, you know, our, our civil service, our government, our media, everyone's been far too relaxed in, in uh, the last 10, 20 years. Like, oh, you know, we won the Cold War. Everything's fine. Let's stop spending so money, much money on defence. How great we can spend it on other things, you know, tax giveaways or, or whatever. I didn't seem to spend it on quite a lot of very useful stuff we would have liked it spent on. But, um, we, as you say, we are in a pre-war age. Everyone who is paying attention says we need to be, uh, you know, spending more. And it's very interesting, particularly those countries on the front line, certainly in Eastern Europe yeah. with, with Russia, they are already, and have been for quite some time, spending a lot more because they understand the reality. The meeting David Cameron's at today was supposed to be all about Ukraine. This is hopefully ahead of a vote in Congress on Saturday, uh, where we're finally going to see the Republicans release huge amounts, billions and billions in aid for Ukraine to help them in their battles against uh, Russia. But we've also now got what's going on in the Middle East, not just Gaza, but the reopening of this whole new side of uh, a conflict in the Middle East, uh, well, it's, should we say, a widening of the conflict uh, with that Iranian attack, uh, drone and missile attack last weekend on Israel. What do you think the appropriate measured response from Israel should be? Right, I, I, I'm going to slightly disagree, Julia, I suspect with what you're saying. Israel has the right to respond. But actually, the, the Iranians were responding to an Israeli strike that killed a bunch of um, IRGC generals, which is always good news. But that was a strike that was in response to Iran sponsoring proxy attacks from Hezbollah, Hamas and the Houthi rebels. I mean, Julia, you can do what you're morally entitled to, or sometimes you can think smart. And in this case, if I was Israel, I would be very careful about striking back, given the success of Israel's layered air defense. And the reason for that is not because they're being weak and wishy-washy and liberal, it's because Hezbollah has thousands and potentially th tens of thousands of potentially effective short-range missiles that uh, Israel will have far less warning to than the relatively sluggish missiles that came from Iran the other day. So if I was an Israeli general, 
I would be urging, urging caution at this time because it's not impossible that with enough fire to Israel, its systems will be overwhelmed or certainly stocks run very, very low. Israel is in a long struggle and long conflict, as Saudi Arabia is, as the Sunni world is, with Iran and its proxies. And just because you can do something now, it doesn't mean you should. And thinking smart for me is learning about the uh, last Saturday's attacks, understanding what the Iranians may have learned from it, and keeping your powder dry because this ain't going to be over in a week's um, time. And yet we've spoken to former, you know, like people like the former military commander of uh, troops uh, of British troops in Afghanistan, Richard Kemp, saying, you no, know, the only language that is understood in the Middle East by these various different organiz uh, organizations and terrorist groups and governments is is strength. And if Israel doesn't respond in kind, perhaps say, you know, attacking just a few military targets as opposed to this massive civilian attack. Uh, that was attempted I think by Iran. Really, I the, think the, the, no, really, but that, that, yeah, that, they, have to, yeah. they have to show yeah. strength. I hear you. I hear you. I think it's a really dumb thing to do. And with great respect to Richard Kemp, I don't always agree with him. And sometimes using force is not necessarily the best way to solve a problem. I think, actually, if I was an Israeli advisor, I would be saying, let's err on the side of caution. Let's kiss our Western allies on side. Uh, they did provide some support. We need their diplomatic cover. We need the arms and intelligence sharing relationships. And we are in a long struggle with Iran. And just because we can hit them, it doesn't necessarily mean we should. So, okay. again, I don't agree with what you say. No, that's OK. That's very interesting. Um, can I also bring you back to uh, events back at home? Um, Mark Menzies, Tory MP colleague of yours, well, until last night, uh, according uh, to... Uh, 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 the reports in the Times newspaper, he is alleged, although he has denied all of this, uh, to have misused campaign funds. So donors yes, they gave money to his local campaign at his uh, file uh, in Lancashire seat. Uh, and that there is a claim that he, at three o'clock in the morning, called his 78-year-old former campaign manager or office manager and said, I need £5,000. I'm being held by bad people uh, in a flat uh, and, I, and they're not going to let me out. This is a matter of life and death. Uh, eventually, another member of his staff actually got £5,000 out and then plus another 1500 from their own uh, savings to pay him and free him from this flat. He then said he would need more money. Uh, he's alleged to have asked for money from the campaign funds uh, to be given to him so he can pay for medical expenses uh, and to deal with other issues like this and that they haven't been paid back. He's now lost the whip. Um, we've now got, is it, 18 MPs in total seeking his independence. Claire Pearce just pointed out, you know, we've actually got a majority that was 80. It's down to only, you know, 40-odd of the Tory party because so many people suspended. Um, have you got a bunch of wrong uns in your party? Um, OK, about this issue, frankly, Julia, I don't give a damn. Um, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm aware of it this morning. I haven't read about it because, frankly, I'm too busy and I've got better things to do. Um, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm sorry, but I think voters might give a damn. I mean, well, misuse question. of campaign funds is alleged. He has not been found guilty of it, but, I mean, you know, he, he deserves the true, you know, well, you're process already, of justice. You? But, you're judging but that him already, would be a criminal offence. Julie, you're judging him already. You're saying no, he's not. I said that fire. would be. OK, look, I'm sorry. I sometimes despair of the debate in this country. I don't know what this guy's done. If he's done something wrong, he should face up to it. Just because one MP's done something stupid, or several, it doesn't mean that we're a government in turmoil any more than Angela Rayner's tax and living situations means that Labour's in turmoil. And actually, five minutes ago, we were talking about a global conflict. Yeah. Now you're talking about... I just think, sorry... I'm not really into politics to talk about the garbage and the side issues. I'm here to talk about stuff that's really important, either to the Isle of Wight... OK, right, I, or, I accept or, that. Or, I accept that. However, I don't, I don't, how, how, don't however, you can get as shirty as you want, Bob, but however, it is relevant to people when they go to vote. And yes, you know, Angela Rayner will look... All parties have had... I mean, goodness me, written as a political editor many years about people from all different parties. This. The trouble with this is these are the sort of stories that people talk about in the pub, talk about at work, and it gives... Everyone in politics a bad name. That's a trouble. Whether or not these allegations are proven or not, and I say he has given a statement where he denies these allegations, um, and again, he should go through the proper uh, process uh, and, and not be judged by us, but these are the allegations that are being made. You are judging him. You're clearly judging him because you're, you're going on about it. I mean, look, fine. No, you want to talk going about, on about... Talking. Sorry, it's on the front I, page just... of a national newspaper. The MP has lost the Tory whip. We're not... You right. say we shouldn't be talking about it. No, you're talking about it, fine. I, 
this is not the stuff that I'm engaged with. And actually, I'll give you as brief an answer as I could, because actually, I don't think it's important to me. It's okay. not important to my folks on the Isle of Wight. It's not important to the country. It's not really important to the future of the world. And I try to focus on stuff that is. All right. Crack Thank on. You. All right, Bob Sidney, thank you for joining us. The Conservative MP uh, for the Isle of Wight, as he just mentioned there, and a member of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Thank you for joining us.